Hi, everybody. <laughs> I, this is the first time I've ever given a talk with a bullhorn, but it's, it's the first time I've, my voice has, has uh, gone south. It's really a first for me. Anyway, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is David Devorkin. I'm the senior curator for astronomy and uh, space science at the National Air and Space Museum. Uh, my specialty is 20th century astrophysics, uh, and uh, I've been at the uh, museum for some 33 years now, and uh, I think we have some pretty good programs going. We've been doing a lot to keep astronomy alive, and uh, we have more on tap uh, for the future. Uh, I think some of you probably enjoyed Katie Nagy's talk. She's our uh, observatory coordinator and supervisor uh, at, the, at the museum. And uh, we put the observatory uh, facility in an overall arching umbrella that includes the planetarium and some of the exhibit space. And we're developing educational programming there. And she's doing a wonderful job uh, making that happen. So my primary uh, reason for existence, of course, is to collect uh, the artifacts of uh, air and space. Uh, and, of course, that would be, for me, it would be astronomy. And it would be primarily space astronomy, but it's not limited to space astronomy. I collect uh, astronomical instrumentation that is relevant to understanding uh, the problems that we choose when we obtain the capability of flying in space with our telescopes and various types of detectors. So I've been doing this sort of thing for quite some time. And among the various... Um, projects that I have developed over the past few years has been this one, and it's the history of the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory under Fred Whipple. Now, what has uh, stimulated this is that uh, as, his, as an historian, and I'm in a department uh, that consists primarily of historians of uh, science, of technology, public policy, uh, and all of us have uh, some responsibility for making decisions as to what we should collect to preserve our heritage, our material heritage of spaceflight. And I realized that the Smithsonian itself uh, offers a very, very interesting and important example of how science changed in uh, the post, what we call the post-World War II era, when the patrons of science changed uh, dramatically. And so the story I'll be talking about today won't be laden with that kind of historiographic uh, consideration, but it will uh, show you the, uh, how at least uh, one particular line of work changed uh, and, and changed in profound ways. And that is catch a falling star, studying meteorites and studying meteor trails and tracking. Now let's see if I can remember how to use this. Okay, here we are. Now, uh, we all know, you know, that some of the most fascinating uh, uh, pictorials that we have from, you know, past uh, textbooks and past posters are these wonderfully impossible meteor showers from 1833 and, and some of the others. I, I love this one, uh, especially. Uh, we're still trying to figure out, you know, how this one, you know, turned around. But, you know, th these are objective, absolutely factual uh, uh, records of what happened, so we have to deal with them. Uh, uh, but they're a lot of fun. But it is a, um, a very important area, uh, and you can approach meteor studies from many, many different areas. What are scientists interested in? Well, where do the meteors come from? And that was debated for many, many years. Different cultures had different um, uh, ideas about that. In fact, the Arabs realized that, yes, these must be uh, particles coming in from, from space, and they must uh, become incandescent in the high atmosphere. And they were the first to realize that it was an estimate of how high the atmosphere is, how far up does the atmosphere extend. And of course, they understood triangulation quite well. And uh, they speculated about it, but they never did any observational work that um, uh, went beyond just the, the, the most casual of visual sightings. It was more of a thought experiment. But of course, in, by the 19th century, uh, that became quite an important thing. Now, why is that doing that? Okay, I think I don't want to go backwards. By the 19th century, 
uh, links between uh, meteoric phenomena and atmospheric phenomena uh, became uh, closer and closer. Uh, some uh, astronomers were saying, well, you know, the meteors appear at about the, at the same heights that we think the aurora is. And again, they determined that by triangulation. And so the connection between meteor studies and the study of these objects from space and what are they, uh, physical objects, of course, and the upper atmosphere of the Earth was linked uh, from uh, very early times. And that's pretty much the story I'll be talking about, how Whipple did that. Fred Whipple, who I'll be talking about. Now, what kind of instrumentation was good for following a meteor? Probably not this refractor from the Paris Observatory. And of course, you'd all know why. It's a very narrow field. So one of the neat aspects of studying the history of meteor reconnaissance is studying the development and application of wide field acquisition of um, uh, phenomena in the sky especially phenomena where you can't predict where you have to point your telescope in order to catch a falling star. And so obviously you want your field to be as wide as possible. And that's quite an interesting problem, a technical problem. And that fascinated uh, the fellow on the left, who is uh, Lewis Morris Rutherford, and the fellow on the right, David Gill. And they both thought that some form of photography uh, should be applied to this. And in the early years of photography, there were very wide angle lenses. They weren't very, very reliable, but they were used primarily for portraiture and other things. And they were relatively easy to adapt uh, in a stationary system simply to monitor the sky and see if you could record a meteor. Uh, the standard sorts of astrographs that were used at that time, uh, like the, uh, uh, the um, uh, double astrograph, these uh, from the carte de ciel, were somewhat wide field. They had typically about a three-quarter degree field, but they weren't enough. You needed something like 10, 15 degree field, and that was the key issue. Barnard, E.E. E. Barnard, was one of the pioneers of ultra-wide field photography, and here is one of his early uh, astrographs, which is a Dalmeyer uh, lens, a standard portrait lens, uh, uh, mounted on a box with as large a plate as he could get. And of course, if you look at those plates at Yerkes Observatory and uh, various other places, you'll see that you know there's an awful lot of distortion on them. And so there was a lot of lot of problems with these cameras because if you want to be able to do very precise tracking of these objects, you have to have a, a photographic uh, field that is very very linear, and any kind of distortions like that are a real problem. Oops. Uh, let's see, what do I do? Ah, there we go. Well, that fascinated William Elkin, that problem. Elkin was a, um, at the time, this photograph of him is uh, quite a bit uh, later, but he became fascinated by the famous 1833 Leonid shower. As you know, a lot of a popular American astronomy was stimulated by that shower, including the Cincinnati Observatory, which uh, the public took up a public subscription for to, to build uh, because Denison Olmsted just absolutely electrified uh, his audiences with um, the, uh, uh, his explanations of, of, of these showers, talking about them as being uh, particles from space and we can get to know what the heavens are made out of. Uh, this was the only connection with heaven. Of course, there was plenty of people who doubted that, saying, no, these are not from space. These are uh, sim simply things that have been shot out of volcanoes or something like that, travel through our atmosphere, and eventually would accumulate, uh, much like uh, in you know very, very um, active <coughs> weather patterns, uh, you could have raining frogs and st stuff like that. Well, you could have raining rocks, too, uh, with, with volcanoes. And in fact, that was one of the biggest scientific questions of the mid-19th century still. Even though these, these objects were understood to be coming into the atmosphere or through the upper edges of the atmosphere, in order to feel that, yes, you were probing the uppermost up, uh, parts of the atmosphere, you had to believe that they came from outer space. Well, how do you determine that? Well, ever since Newton, we had the answer for that. Is the object on an escape velocity trajectory? Is it traveling faster than the escape velocity of the Earth? which is something that we know a lot about since Newton. So you have to be able to track that meteor and track it over time with a triangulation that is very well calibrated and determine 
you know how fast it's going. The angular rate as a function of time and you get uh, let's say uh, two different cameras uh, separated 15, 20 miles apart and uh, you know their separation, you know the parallax, you get, the, uh, you get a sense of the distance to the meteor and you get its trajectory. And with a, a chopper or something like that as we understand it today, uh, you can get its velocity. William Elkin said, yeah, that's what he wanted to do. He was, again, he was a lot younger than this in the 1830s and 40s. And by the 1850s, uh, he had convinced Hubertus Angus Newton of Yale that uh, this is what we should do, especially with the new advent of uh, photographic plates. It took a number of several more decades uh, for Elkin to realize this. In fact, he really didn't get going until the 1880s and 1890s. And at that time, you know, photography was coming in, but it didn't displace uh, visual methods. And in fact, Elkin is also very well known as one of the um, two astronomers in the United States who ever used a uh, heliometer, a visual device for determining spectral uh, 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 stellar parallaxes. Um, so anyway, so Elkin, oh darn, I keep on doing that wrong. Okay, here we go. Elkin uh, put together a specially fine set of camera lenses. Uh, these are again portrait camera lenses, and this one is in the Yale collection. Uh, and built a series of, of um, uh, cameras and developed a very interesting procedure. I mean, we didn't know where the, uh, no one would know where the meteor would, would shoot from, you know. And so the idea was to cover as wide a field as possible. And up on, um, on Prospect Street in New Haven, because they were at Yale, uh, at the Winchester Observatory up there, named after Winchester Arms, which was on Division Street right there. Uh, that was my first apartment right there. Um, was this observatory that had uh, this battery of six uh, astrographs that certainly simply would monitor the sky. Uh, for the photographs would be about uh, 15, 10 to 15 minutes long. It would be guided so the stars would be uh, star-like. And if meteor trails happened, well, that's great. Now, there was, this was only one of the two stations. He needed a triangulation system, of course. And so he had one system uh, that was in New Haven uh, that is essentially on Whitney Boulevard, downtown New Haven, or Prospect Street, which is parallel to Whitney, and another one uh, that was a field station out in Hamden, uh, Connecticut. And this was the first of the photographic triangulation stations. And Elkin's work was very, very well regarded by other astronomers, and everyone was very excited about it. But there was one problem. The triangulation base that he had was less than about five, six miles, and that did not give very high accuracy. Also, the lenses he was using uh, didn't have linear fields, and so there were a lot of distortions. The distortion was a function of position angle and everything, so a lot of technical problems uh, were, were um, in that. This is just uh, some of the early ones that he, he had uh, developed by 1900. You could see uh, that he was tracking uh, meteor trails uh, uh, with approximate altitudes on the right side of, of the screen. Uh, and the meteors were coming to an incandescence uh, between 88 and uh, 101 approximately, or 70 to 80 miles in altitude. But this was a beginning. This was a beginning. And with these, he could show that the velocity of these meteors was very, very high. And in fact, the, the, a new question came up. Are they escape velocity or are they beyond escape velocity? Are they parabolic or are they hyperbolic? And this became a cosmological question. Because if they are hyperbolic, they come from outside the solar system. If they're parabolic, well, they come from somewhere in the solar system. How many was timing? He had, a, he had a chopper, and it was not synchronous or anything like that. So we're talking, you know, first order. Yeah, but he definitely, he, he developed the... Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He was one of the first. Elkin was a, was a very crafty guy. But then lenses had to get better, and Ernst Abbey, of course, is one of the uh, well-known names for producing precision uh, camera lenses that had fully linear feels. 
and he would balance the index of refraction and the curvature of the different lenses for the crown and flint so everything would come to zero you know you had to add them all up I, I don't remember how to do it I took a class in it once and if, if you got it all balanced perfectly with all the curves and everything you could get a really flat field and the Abbey lenses then replaced the Dalmeyers and, and the Voigtlanders and, and all of the other ones, which were fine for portraiture. But you know, I mean, who cares if your nose is a little out of joint, you know, uh, on a portrait? But boy, if your star is not there, that's not good. Uh, we're talking very small errors. So the Abbey design, of course, was was a very very uh, efficient, and because uh, it used also less glass, uh, and and uh, relatively economical because it only had six um, uh, six. Uh, sides to figure, and it, it really became an, an important uh, uh, part of photographic wide field astrophotography uh, in the teens and the 20s of the 20th century. Well, one of the people who picked up on that was uh, E.C. Pickering, and he started, and he really believed in photography, and he started uh, developing a photographic patrol system based upon Abbey lenses. He replaced all of his portrait lenses. And at Harvard, um, they would scan the skies night after night after night after night. And all of those plates have been stored, you know, in the Harvard plate vaults. And they've been incomparably valuable for all sorts of re reasons. They weren't used for meteor work, though. Uh, he didn't put the sectors on there. He just applied photography. So photography was becoming, of course, the chief uh, detector of choice uh, in astronomy by the second and third decades of the 20th century, replacing visual. But yes? Pardon? Where is this? Oh, this is Harvard College Observatory. Some of those domes are still there. Um, this is the 15 inch that you can go and see. And some of these buildings have been condemned. Uh, and these domes, I think most of them are gone. I'm, I'm not absolutely sure. I think one of them is still left in the parking lot. Yeah. Um, and th this, is, this is Harvard from way back, turn of the century. Thank you. Yeah, sure. And please feel free to, to ask questions. Um, you definitely say it looks a lot different now. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Oh, absolutely. Uh, the story of building at Harvard. How many people have been to the Harvard College Observatory and got lost in the buildings? <laughs> yeah, because it was built like topsy, you know, or if that's the right term. Okay, well, Pickering, though, was quite conservative, and uh, he, he was, um, in, in his work, he uh, would um, uh, uh, believe that the, um, uh, one had to do photography, wide field photography, very, very efficiently. So he did not join with the Carte du Ciel and with the astrographic chart service of the Europeans. He didn't uh, uh, devote himself to that. He, uh, founded his own program, and that was a very important part of uh, the United States establishing its own agenda in observational astronomy. Up to that point, everybody followed the French uh, or the Germans, depending upon what part of astronomy you were doing. But Pickering wanted to establish uh, Harvard, should I say, as the central laboratory for science, uh, including uh, astronomy. And most of the Harvard professors, late 19th century, early 20th, had that uh, idea in mind, and this is a this is a feeling that pervades even uh, post World War II that I'm writing about in a, in a book right now. So, what about Pickering's successor? Ever hear of Harlow Shapley? Yeah. Oh, absolutely, and you know he's one of the great names in in uh, American astronomy, 20th century. But he was a peculiar guy. He had some interesting things. He didn't like photography. And here's a guy who, you know, flourished in the teens and 20s and 30s and 40s and 50s and everything, but he really loved visual work. And he believed that, at least for meteor work, it's well known. And uh, well known means who knows? That means it's Shapley's opinion. Uh, that photography of meteor trails with ordinary telescopes is not a productive line of investigation. Well, he's, he's right. Ordinary telescopes, sure. But he was ignoring the fact that his own, his own predecessor, Pickering, had pioneered very wide field cameras. And for some reason, he wanted to do meteor investigation visually. He was stimulated in this by the uh, Estonian polymath named Ernst Erpik. 
a very interesting name in the history of astronomy uh, who deserves a better understanding. He's one of those characters like Fritz Swicky, who you may have heard of, you know, that everybody, you know, loved to hate uh, because uh, they, would, they would always criticize everybody else's work. And Erpik was, was, was even better at it than Zwicky. Uh, but Harlow Shapley saw the genius in Ernst Erpik, brought him from Dorpat to uh, Harvard, and together in the 20s, they developed a uh, meteor project to try to ascertain the origins of meteors. And this is, again, this topic of where do they come from? Are they solar system objects? Uh, some seem to be swarms that seem to be related to cometary orbits. You're probably all aware of that. But not all of them. There's also the sporadics. And there are also the fainter ones that seem to be of a different class than the brighter ones. A uh, different <laughs> class in terms of how high in the atmosphere they disintegrate. Um, so there were different classes of meteors. And Erpik had this theory, and it was a brilliant theory, that they came from interstellar space and they were hyperbolic, and he was bound and determined to make this measurement, and Shapley and Shaw and Boothroyd from Cornell and various other people, they, they organized the Harvard um, uh, Cornell Meteor Expedition in the 1920s to go out to, um, to, to, go out to uh, Arizona uh, in, in the summers and sometimes in the winters, a very nice place to be, and um, that just says the same. Same thing there about the, uh, the value of the uh, visual sightings. They built these little boxes, stuck people in them, had grids in the windows, and of course they would record uh, meteor trails over time. And this was something that I think amateurs have done. Uh, this is a uh, popular uh, activity, at least it had been in the past, for tracking meteor trails. Uh, and they would do these and also triangulate them. and. Uh, Erpik, in fact, and this shows you just how creative he was, he developed, though, a photographic technique along with this. This is one of the most creative things I've ever seen. Okay, here is a telescope. Oh, darn. Oh, there we go. Oh, come on. Work. It, it, only, lights up, it only lights up when I point it to my eyes. Oh, there we go. Okay, there's a telescope lens. There's a photographic plate up in, in, inside. There's a mirror, and that mirror vibrates, okay? And it just sits there and vibrates. When you get a, a slow-moving meteor, uh, it produces uh, a, a wide squiggle. A fast-moving meteor produces a different type of curve, and the loops from that are an indication of the speed of the meteor. Erpik, like I said, was brilliant. He set up these things, he did them photographically, and um, uh, this was the sort of thing that even though Shapley said, well, you can't do it photographically, Erpik found a way to do it. And this absolutely fascinated people for determining, and this is without a chopper. You don't need a chopper this way, it's just a little oscillating mirror. Now, people who, uh, by the early 30s, who worked for Shapley, didn't fully agree with uh, uh, his feeling that visual techniques were better. Erpik's oscillating mirror showed that they could get plenty of meteor trails, uh, but they couldn't get them quite faint enough. They needed much better lenses. And during this time, and by the mid-20s, people like Frank Ross, and you may have heard of Ross triplets and stuff like that, started developing much larger, very wide field, very, very efficient astrographs uh, that um, you can see a picture of it uh, on the right-hand side. I have in my personal collection. Before I went to the museum 33 years ago, I still, I, I collected telescopes, but I had to sign an affidavit saying I will not collect personally anymore. But I've got one of, I got one of these. Very, very wide angle. Um, uh, one is in the yellow, one is in the blue, and it was for doing uh, uh, rough uh, colorimetry. Uh, very interesting stuff from, from your keys. But anyway, uh, with, with Ross, with the advent of better photographic technologies, uh, it became clear to people like Bart Bach, here he is in his, one of his calmer moods, and uh, this is Peter Millman over here, and others at Harvard, that really photography was the way to go. And we should take what Shapley has been doing, but bring photography back in. 
And I always love to find astronomers in, in groups. And there's Fred, Fred Whipple, uh, at a meeting, in an early meeting, where he uh, announced that he was going to develop a photographic meteor uh, program at Harvard, uh, something that Shapley completely supported, wasn't a problem. Uh, and the, um, for him, Fred's argument at that time uh, was that, uh, you know, there's some 30,000 meteors in the world's collection, uh, and um, uh, very few of them were actually seen to fall. Now, why is that important? If you track the fall of a meteor, you know where it came from. And if you look at the composition of that meteor, you can figure out if there's a composition gradient in the solar nebula, in interstellar space, or whatever. Or you can determine that, yes, it is extraterrestrial if it has a fundamentally different uh, constituencies, which you know it does. Widmanstetten figures, chondrules, all of those little things that you see in meteors, you don't see in terrestrial rocks. That's how you identify a meteor. You know, you wander around with a magnetometer and you, and you find something and it, something clicks and it doesn't, that doesn't mean I am a meteor. You then have to look at it and, uh, and, and check it microscopically or etch it with uh, nitric acid or something like that. So his idea was let's track these things and then find them. So let's, he, he had a wholly different idea. Yes, he was interested in the upper atmosphere and that was part of his research, but he also wanted to triangulate even more accurately and catch the meteors. That's what I mean when I say catch a falling star. And he would get the trajectory and get the composition so that he could build up an astrophysical record of what's going on. That's the next step in the history of meteoritics that he initiated. Well, he also uh, was the first to s suggest that we get away from uh, uh, portrait lenses, as good as the Ross lenses were. And by the 30s, as you know, there was this thing, this reflector, this hybrid reflector called the Schmidt. There's Bernhard Schmidt in his laboratory, uh, and one of the early Schmidts, and I don't have to describe for this audience, I'm sure, uh, what makes a Schmidt work and that it's very wide field, and it can be made to be a, a, a very precise field as well. Uh, and the basic Schmidt system is what uh, Whipple suggested at first that uh, they might apply to uh, meteor work. Now, by then, I should, I should not forget the fact. Yes, question. Um, do those folks try and find the meteorites when they determine the trajectory? Yes, absolutely. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, if, if you were so in your mind to try to do it, it's not a, not a trivial thing. Yeah, yeah very, very few uh, were, were found that way. And I think maybe you guys would know better than me. I don't think any irons were found that way. It was all, it was all stonies. Is, does anybody have a sense of that? I just haven't done my homework. Okay, okay, well, anyway. Uh, before this time, still in the 30s, as Whipple was thinking about this, he said, the trouble is, this takes money, making telescopes takes money. Meanwhile, he simply improved on the photographic methods using synchronous motors uh, for the choppers, and he increased his baseline uh, between two stations, one at Harvard, uh, that place I showed you, and the other one was out in Concord, Mass., yeah, or actually more accurately, at Harvard Mass, where the Oak Ridge Station was. Fred was, one of his first jobs, Fred Whipple's first job when he was hired by Shapley, was to build the Oak Ridge Station, or also known as the Agassiz Station, where the YS-61 inches and all of that stuff. You know it's closed now as of 2005. Uh, and that's a long story. Anyway, with that, what did Fred find? He refined the velocities and he found that none of the meteors were hyperbolic. Oh boy. Erpik didn't like that. Shapley didn't like that. But they were, Fred's data was good enough so that they had to start rethinking. You know what we call the Oort cloud? You ever hear of the Oort cloud? Well, that's what, uh, that's what Erpik uh, was talking about except that he was even farther out than that. He was talking about stuff coming 
from truly interstellar distances. But his basic concept was that this was the bony frame of the uh, nebula that formed the solar system, which is essentially, uh, physically at least, uh, the Oort. But Oort, of course, um, uh, was the one who uh, uh, nailed it. So, so Fred had already established himself pretty strongly in the 30s in this meteor work, and he was very good. He was a very good mathematician, very good orbit person. He also uh, did a lot in upper atmosphere work, linking it to that. And so through the war, and he did some fascinating things during the war, uh, but I won't talk about it here unless you make me. Um, uh, then after the war, of course, he wanted to continue on improving his meteor networks. And guess what he had after the war? Money. Why? Because he could study the atmosphere uh, with ballistic projectiles uh, that could help the Navy, the Army, better understand ballistics, reentry ballistics, things that we shoot into space that may come back and uh, bomb some other city. Yeah, a lot of money in that. So there's a whole new patron with a whole new set of ideas, and Fred makes himself very, very useful to these guys, and he starts building them. Well, uh, that's Walter Botta, that's Theodore Dunham. Uh, all of these are just to show you that the Schmidt design was picked up real quickly. That's the lower Schmidt from San Diego. Anybody know about the lowers? Wonderful uh, amateur opticians who built some of the first F1 Schmidt's beautiful instruments. We have them at the Smithsonian. We, we acquired them. Now, there was a guy that Fred turned to, and I love to find them in groups. Now, this one, uh, you have to apply. Uh, how many people watch Law and Order? No? Terrible. You just won't admit it. All right. All right. Well, you know, it drives me crazy when they go to a uh, photograph like this and they zoom in on something and they bring up a picture that's perfectly in resolution, <laughs> right? Okay, you've seen it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, that's what I did here. It's James Baker. There he is. Okay. You see? Uh, see, I can do that too. James Baker was the person who Whipple turned to say, build me a camera out of the Schmidt. And oh boy, what did James Baker do? James Baker spent the war uh, in uh, Division 16.1 of the OSRD, which is optics, uh, run by Theodore Dunham. And uh, Baker was the genius at building fantastic optical systems. Here is a picture of, um, of a uh, very wide field uh, picture of Orion uh, that is in, in a classified NDRC uh, publication to demonstrate what his F1.4 2 mirror solid Schmidt uh, could do. But he didn't do this for astronomical work. His job was to create uh, devices that could produce flat optical fields uh, for all sorts of um, uh, simulation characteristics to, uh, for, for pilot training and, and things like that. He went through all of the types of tests that the Mount Wilson people had done and realized that with his Schmitz, he, he could do much, much better. So, uh, you know, knowing that uh, there was a lot of optical development during the war, people like uh, Otto Struve uh, would write things like, uh, well, you know, these are wonderful lenses, these are wonderful optical systems. Uh, they probably won't be of any use in the war, but boy, can we use them after the war. And that's, that's the sort of thing that really changed things. Yeah, that was Struve to Harlow Shapley uh, in 1943, Yerkes Observatory Archives. So here's one of the things that, uh, that um, uh, Baker came up with. And this is actually a device uh, that takes a spherical field and flattens it. Uh, and keeps, it keeps the uh, uh, scaling uh, absolutely precise. So it goes from a hemisphere to a flat plane. And he, it was used for all sorts of different purposes. It was sort of like a hammer and everything looks like a nail kind of a thing. So, you know, okay, well, what did he do with this? Well, one of the things he did was it's a Schmidt, basically, a very sophisticated Schmidt. Uh, he built this camera, which covered 120 degrees, being a Schmidt, it had a curved field, and that was part of the problem, which was not very popular among the military field. They asked him to build Schmitts that had flat fields, which he did. That's called the Baker Schmidt. 
and he started developing these things um, and refining them. For Whipple, though, uh, the curved feel wasn't that much of a problem. And here's the design that he came up with for a very, very wide field Schmidt with huge correcting lenses here uh, that would uh, come through here and here's a mirror uh, and come to the focal plane right in here. A very, very sophisticated system with all sorts of uh, correctors. Uh, these are little color correctors here. Um, but were those all spherical surfaces? They were all spherical. So, to some extent, it was easier to make. Oh, sure. It was, it was something that, in fact, um, uh, I'm trying to remember whether it was Kodak or who made some of the... I mean, the different corporations wanted to make them to get the experience. Itech and Perkin-Elmer. Little, little early for Itech, but Perkin-Elmer definitely was in there, yeah. Uh, okay, where are we? Okay. So, this is the first Super Schmidt. Uh, you can see it's highly compact and very, very um, uh, 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 sophisticated. It had that rotating shutter there and had a very robust mounting. And these things cost money, but the Navy was only too happy to provide it for not one, but ten of them. And they would be spread around in an array. And they started working on meteor trails primarily to get at the uh, temperature and pressure of the upper atmosphere to better improve ballistic tables. That's what it was all about. But Fred himself, Fred Whipple, of course, was using it for his meteor studies. And there's a picture of one of the curved uh, photographic plates, which are, um, uh, uh, at first it was a problem, by the way, but it turned out Kodak or someone figured out how to uh, mold those things easily, and so they made them by the thousands. So that was it. Here's one of the fields. And thank you, thank you for uh, uh, identifying the field. Uh, how many can identify it straight out? See? You said it was uh, Ariga in the upper right? Yeah, that, that's north. That's north direction, yeah. The Pleiades are down there. Anyway, uh, if you uh, take simultaneous pictures with these Baker Schmitz that are separated by several miles, uh, you, get a, you get a meteor trail on one, and you get another meteor trail on the other. And the difference in the two, of course, with the knowledge of how um, uh, um, uh, uh, separated the, uh, the two stations were, will give you the impact point. And that's exactly what they were going for. Now, there was another application for this too, and this is one reason Whipple uh, found that uh, the various agencies, and later on the Air Force too, was very interested in this. And that is, when they do re-entry tests, they want to find the stuff quick. And that, that's, that's where the technology came from. So why triangulate meteors? And he was talking about the context. The context, the physical context, is vital. And for him, of course, it's the composition map of the solar system. But for the, um, uh, uh, his patrons, it was getting at uh, shards and samples that re-entered in the atmosphere uh, from various uh, field tests of uh, ballistic projectiles, such as uh, Cold War science. Now, Whipple had been working with the Navy and the Army uh, for several years by now. This is the early 50s. And he found them to be somewhat mercurial and quixotic in their interests. Uh, they could easily change their interests, and all of a sudden, the money was gone. And he was looking for another source of funding that was big enough to, uh, to keep him going. And I mean, these are expensive here. Here's the one in Haleakala. And uh, we're still wondering, well, why was it set up in Haleakala? And they were triangulating uh, ballistic tests in Haleakala. Um, they, they, they included, uh, you know, camera rooms, observatories, staff. Uh, there were at least uh, staffs of 20, 30 people involved with these things. So this is the early 50s, and the world is really changing. Now let me just shift to Washington, D.C., this is the Smithsonian Institution. Uh, that's the castle, the Smithsonian Castle. There, the old building. 
And the Astrophysical Observatory of the Smithsonian is here. This is where Langley established his solar observatory and where Abbott carried out solar observations as a base camp for his worldwide distribution of solar monitoring stations for determining the solar constant. Uh, but the question after the war was whether the Astrophysical Observatory, the Smithsonian Institution. The first academic director of the Smithsonian was Leonard Carmichael. And he asked questions about Smithsonian research uh, and started wondering if in this new world of uh, post-World War II accountability, could the Smithsonian's research survive? Because it had been very, very, very isolated and uh, 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 I don't know what the proper term is, but they, did, they weren't accountable to anybody. Um, and Abbott was a genius, of course, at maintaining uh, patronage, and that's a whole other story. Well, uh, he, uh, uh, Carmichael had an advisor, Vannevar Bush, uh, who had created the uh, Office of Scientific Research and Development in uh, World War II and had uh, then set up a, uh, what you might call a research reserve, the concept that the universities were a critical um, agent of national security. And you want to keep employed very, very effective groups of scientists who are ready to solve problems relating to national security. During, you know, keeping them employed, though, you have to keep them happy. So let them do what they want to do, but they could be called upon to do important stuff when needed. And the Smithsonian was no different. It had to associate itself with a university. Well, it's a long story of how it finally ended up at Harvard, but by 1955, Abbott's, all of Abbott's solar stations here that uh, from 1910 to 1950 that had been studying the solar constant were closed down and Abbott himself retired and the Smithsonian was transferred in name only, not in equipment, not in people, not in facilities, in name only as a budget line to Harvard. And that is a very, very significant uh, uh, part of the um, uh, uh, origins of what we now know is the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory at Harvard. At the time, there were astronomers like Leo Goldberg, R. R. McMath in the middle there, and, and Donald Menzel, who debated as to where the Smithsonian should go. Menzel finally made an appeal. Carmichael uh, accepted it, and uh, they set up something called Solar Associates, which included the Harvard College Observatory, the Climax Observatory, the Bureau of Standards, uh, the um, uh, Signal Corps, I think that was, and government contracting, uh, all to study and monitor the sun for ionospheric purposes. However, when the Smithsonian did move to Harvard, it was placed under Whipple. Whipple was not interested in the sun. Whipple was interested in the upper atmosphere, Whipple was interested in ballistics. He was the only professional astronomer in the United States who was on the V2 panel. He was a colleague of Werner von Braun, and he, his dear dream was space flight. And he was already by then making a pitch to take his expertise in meteor tracking and apply it to satellite tracking. And that's where he saw his opportunity. The Smithsonian would give him a chance to do that on a scale that was heretofore unknown in astronomy. But in so doing, it redefined what it meant to be an astronomical observatory. Whipple was on the Hoover panel, for instance. And there's von Braun, there's Colonel Hoover. Uh, here are the pioneers in, in space, American space research. There's Whipple there. Uh, there's the guy who built the Viking. Uh, rocket for NRL, all sorts of uh, very important people there. Um, this was the original project that had, was proposed by the Navy uh, for the U.S. entry into space during the IGY. It was turned down, of course, as we all know, and, um, um, uh, sorry, it was the, the uh, it was the Army, this was the Army. It was turned down because mm -hmm. the Navy won, won the uh, bid to uh, launch Vanguard. Okay, so Whipple, though, with this new patronage, was able to scale up the uh, Baker 
uh, the, the Baker Superschmidt into the Baker Nun satellite camera and uh, spread them around the world in rather large and sophisticated facilities that had as much to do with uh, the US um, Foreign Service and the diplomatic service as it did uh, with science. Uh, this was a very, very important element in Cold War uh, diplomacy uh, for uh, the United States during the IGY. And this was his dear dream, to establish astronomy at a level that had heretofore been unknown. Here's the network, of course, that he established all around the world. And what, uh, when I interviewed him back in 77, he said, what I had in mind, why I took the job of the directorship was so I could then operate this photographic satellite observing program under the aegis of the Smithsonian rather than Harvard. Harvard was not enthusiastic about research of this scale, especially directly related to uh, national security needs. Now, to give you an idea of how expensive it was, uh, during, this is the Project Vanguard uh, uh, budget, uh, some $19 million total. Three million of it was for optical tracking, and that all went to the Smithsonian. So that was a huge, you might say, uh, 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 jump in, in, uh, in, in patronage uh, for any kind of astronomical institution during that time. He hired people like J. Allen Hynek, you see there, uh, to operate his, uh, his, his optical uh, network. Uh, the uh, Baker Nun itself was a uh, refinement and an enlargement of the Super Schmidt. Uh, the teams were uh, very well trained and became sort of public events in different areas. Uh, then the surprise came, and that of course is Sputnik. The uh, Baker Nun system was not ready, uh, nor was the NRL mini track ready when Sputnik flew. But there was some tracking system that was ready. Anybody know the name of it? You got it, absolutely. And that was also what Whipple was doing all this time. He knew that there was both a very important publicity angle, but a very important practical angle in this whole thing. What is the one thing you don't know when somebody launches a satellite? You don't know its trajectory. You've got to be able to go back to the most brute force, rough estimates of where the darn thing is to get a zeroth order ephemeris. And of course, that's what Shapley was saying all along. <laughs> but, I mean, uh, you know. Uh, so we're, you've got Project Moonwatch. And of course, there's some familiar people there. There's Grace Spitz uh, and uh, Tommy Cragg back there. And uh, anybody know Tommy Cragg? Famous uh, Los Angeles amateur astronomer who was also a professional at Mount Wilson very active in the Los Angeles Astronomical Society. How about Walter Haas? You've heard of him, ALPO, Association of Lunar and Planetary Observers. Yeah. So you know, there's some, some familiar people there. And for some strange reason, I cannot remember her name. Can anybody help? AABSO. Mar Margaret Mayo, that's right. Margaret Mayo. Okay, I mean, these, these, were, these were, this was the, the, the core of amateur astronomy at the time that were put together and recruited in the same way in the Cold War that civilians were recruited for what was called the Ground Observer Corps. I don't know if any of you ever recall that, but you know, there were these concerns, you know, that you had to have visual observers out there, observers on the ground. Uh, in the early 50s, late 40s, to be ready if, my God, something would come. You know, we need to be warned as early as possible. Uh, so Armin Smith, Spitz, who, of course, founded Spitz uh, Space Systems and that sort of thing, became uh, the director. And uh, he also became the coordinator of the visual observations of satellites for Whipple. He was hired by Whipple because he was a wonderful networker. Uh, the uh, systems were set up both at military uh, bases and uh, at civilian places. I was part of a, 
a, a crew uh, led by the Santa Monica team of du Douglas Aircraft. I was in uh, uh, junior high school at the time, and that was my introduction to such things. And it was very exciting, especially when they started saying, what is that thing in the West? It must be something, it must be. And I said, it's Venus. And here I am, you know, uh, I was about 13, 14 years old, and all these people, all these engineers, <laughs> that's Venus. Oh, well, anyway, that's my history. Okay. <laughs> But it's a wonderful history of how important the moon watch was because they were beautifully regimented uh, in a very, very interesting way to be able to get a first order estimate of the trajectories of these satellites. And they got them right away. They were, uh, they were doing drills as early as 56 and 57. And when Sputnik went up, they were ready. And they had predictions that they sent into the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory and the first um, Baker Nunn that had not even been fully set up yet, but it was sitting still in the Bowler and Shivens shop in Pasadena, was uh, taken out, set up hastily, and, oh, there's another shot of it. There's another shot. And darned if they didn't catch it with a mount that still didn't track. So there's one of the first, and this is a good example of what you were saying where you have a long and short exposure because th there, those are long and short exposures to be able to determine direction and, and uh, uh, stuff like that. For a while, the identification was confused by the media. They thought that the dot was Sputnik and that the rectangle was the uh, launch, um, uh, the, 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 the stage that went into orbit with uh, Sputnik. You know, we weren't looking at Sputnik. We were looking at the size of the, of the stages that went into orbit with Sputnik. That tells you what their launch capability was. A Sputnik was just the symbol. So this was the beginning of the Baker Nunn system, and it put the Smithsonian on the front page of every magazine uh, you can imagine. There's Whipple, there's uh, Hynek on the top of the Earth uh, with the Vanguard orbit, and that's Carl Hennies there uh, in the bottom. Uh, he later on went off to the astronaut corps. Now, as a result, the Smithsonian grew like Topsy. Uh, they got a lot of contract money. They were able to sustain other uh, projects with the so, uh, satellite tracking money. Uh, they developed a, a, uh, one of the first of the orbiting astrophysical observatory uh, uh, payloads called Celescope for OAO2. They started developing uh, one of the finest uh, uh, stellar atmospheres group. Uh, they got heavily into geodesy. Uh, they got heavily into uh, all sorts of standard Earth and standard tracking work. And as you can see by the numbers, by the mid-60s, uh, there was well over 400, uh, leading to 500 people on staff. And they started in 1955 with two. So that's growth. This is just the contribution by the Celescope project. Uh, and this is putting something into orbit that was equivalent to uh, what space telescope is now, even though it didn't work very well. And I, I can talk for hours about that. What happened to the scientists in 63 and beyond? Uh, oh, what, let's see. What, uh, what prompts you to ask that question from here? Uh, there's no blue, dark blue bars in 63, 64, 65. It's just like tracking the data. Uh, we, yeah, I don't think we finished it. Yeah, there's still plenty of scientists there. Yeah, the dark bars are scientific staff, quite right. And then the, the light blue are total staff. No, no, they, they, they weren't uh, separated, but uh, thank you. I think I, I'll, I'll update this graph. <laughs> Here's the overall funding. This is what I thought you might be referring to, and I couldn't imagine you saw it so quickly. Here is overall total funding for uh, the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory. It looks pretty bad right in here. This was the effect of the drop off in Apollo and also the rise of the Vietnam War and the, um, uh, the end of the Democrats and the beginning of the Republican administration in here. Um, Massachusetts was the only state who voted against Nixon. There you go. Okay. <laughs> However, the Smithsonian, as I'm working on now, was somewhat insulated from that. If you were to look at this curve for other astrophysical observatories, it would tank and it would not revive as anywhere near as quickly 
as Smithsonian did. What made the difference? The federal contribution, even though the direct went off, the federal and the indirect supported them and led to new highs in the 1970s. And this is because it was a hybrid institution. It was, it was um, uh, multiple sources. It had a direct line to Congress. Now this has produced an amazing political history of the Smithsonian, which I'm having a lot of fun going through, but it's, it's causing me uh, to stay awake at night. It's not a bad story, it's just a complex story, but it is a story that I hope will be revealing of what science, how science is done today on a very large scale. Thank you. Aren't you glad I didn't use my notes? <laughs> yes. Um, I know SAO published a lot of just group statistics on meteor counts. Oh, sure. In that time. And I always associated that with meteor radio counts. How much of that was funded also by Army and Air Force? A lot of it. They were using it. A lot of it. A lot of it was being uh, funded out of Haystack uh, and uh, the uh, Lincoln Labs. And there were, um, uh, one of the biggest projects that was attempted uh, that the Smithsonian led was to increase that and to do radar echoing studies. Um, there, the most grandiose project, and you'll love this, is a 440 foot fully steerable dish in a radio, and it was called NIROC. It never happened. It came into competition with the VLA, and uh, the Smithsonian finally backed down in about 71. But, but it, uh, they were doing a lot of radio meteor work. They were using the Natick um, uh, array and various other arrays all over the place. They had three or four different radio stations. Did, did Whipple and the other astronomers sort of take a lead in proposing that Meteor bounce was a reliable communications method? That I don't know. I think uh, Lovell certainly made the point much earlier in Britain. And Peter Millman also did, and he was in Canada. He was a Harvard fellow, but, uh, but um, I don't think, I don't know. Uh, that's a good question. Because there's some issues about the statistics, because they thought it could be used for secure communications. So right, right, right. I think it was originally, that's where, where Meteor Scatter originally got all of its money, and it actually turned into a fairly reliable secure mm -hmm. communication yeah. system. Yeah. You yeah. know, back in the day. Yeah, that's right. What happened yeah. to the Moonwatch uh, thing after the Baker and Nunnels uh, panels got formed? The Moonwatch program continued uh, because the Baker Nuns still needed predictions. And it was a, a, a great project that just brought in uh, thousands of people all over the world. And it was a very, um, a very real program. It was just a terrific program. I mean, it, yeah. There's a there's a very good book by uh, uh, by uh, Patrick McCrae, uh, who uh, uh, talks about its its lifetime through the early to mid '60s. Yeah. I don't think there's anything organized at this time, on any national scales. The Smithsonian is not doing it anymore. Okay, any other questions? Well, thanks a lot. When were the cameras decommissioned? The Baker Nunts <coughs> were, were decommissioned in the uh, early 70s. They survived various um, threatened cutbacks and, uh, and, and a number of different crises. Um, in the early 60s, there was a, a crisis that the Air Force wanted to turn it, or DOD wanted to turn it all classified. Uh, they uh, managed to convince uh, DOD not to. They continued going, and then NASA wanted to replace it and take, take it over themselves. Uh, but then they developed the laser tracking, which gave them the, uh, the accuracy that, that they needed. Uh, much later, much later. But Baker Nuns weren't doing much, to my knowledge, by the mid 70s, certainly. They were That's gone. about the time that T.O. Lambert took over. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Dr. Hmm. Uh, I came in a little late, but is one of these Baker Nuns at the Smithsonian? Program? Yes, yes, we have one, and we are. Um, I am fighting the bureaucracy to try to get it reassembled. 
uh, but it's a question of where it would go and stuff like that. Yeah, it's the first one. And, and it was the one you know, that was in the Pasadena shops uh, that took the first uh, images of Sputnik. And it went to Oregon Pass in uh, New Mexico. And then from there, it went to Mount Hopkins in Tucson, outside of Tucson. Yeah, write your congressman. <laughs> no, I mean, it, it's safe. It, it's in good shape. Yeah, and we have all the documentation for it. Yes. Yeah. There was a thing called the Norton Bob site that was used in B-17s. Sure. And I was wondering if any of those guys had anything to do with that. Oh, during World War II? Yeah, any of the people you Oh, guys. definitely. The OSRD section, 16.1, uh, did a lot of uh, work with uh, periscopic uh, uh, torpedo uh, uh, ships and uh, things. Oh, yeah. Whether, whether they did the Norton, uh, Norton um, don't know. Have you seen flak bait? We have it in the museum with the, with the, nor with the bomb site sitting there. No. You better see it quick. We're moving it. <laughs> Do you like your Telluride? What? Does he, does he use the Telluride? Yes. The design is very similar. Uh, <laughs> yes, yes. Identical. Very good, so very good. You're using a Norton bomb site if you have the Telluride. Mm -hmm. no, I, for that Rigel thing. I, 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 will, I will tell the aeronautics guys you said that because they, I, I said that once to them and they said, so? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. See, no, that's very great. And it's better than all the other damn finders that don't work and get unaligned. What's it called? Is it, 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 not six. Yeah, what is the term for the, uh, that, that, is it a virtual image? What's it called optically? Beam splitter. It's a beam splitter, yeah. But it, it, it just works. Yeah. <laughs> and that gives you a, an aerial image. It's a and zero, it's magnitude, it's yeah. a zero yeah. magnification finder. Right, but it's also, it, it doesn't have parallax. Tele telecentric, I think. Telecentric, yeah. that's it. That's the term, yeah. No, that's a beautiful thing. And then Norton, yeah. Any other? Um, did Rob or find a star? Did McRae yeah. design the Moon Watch <laughs> Telescope? Uh, uh, Baker? No. Oh, who wrote the history? No, no, no. Uh, McRae is a young guy. I mean, he's, uh, he was one of my students. We had a bunch of moon launch telescopes. Somebody brought in for a talk and initials. It had the initial of McRae on it? Uh, yeah. A lot of them were made by amateurs. Okay. Yeah. Edmund made one standard design. There was one that was sanctioned by the Smithsonian. Uh, but it used ed essentially Edmund parts. Uh, very, very nice things. I can't remember the war surplus optical elements, but I'm pretty sure the eyepiece was an Urfel. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I remember, I remember buying some commercial thing, which was equivalent a telescope that looked down and had a flat mirror. Yeah. You could read off an inclination. Yeah. And I think the main thing was getting it lined up on the meridian. That's right. That's right. And that was the technique. It was a really, really sharp, uh, nice technique. Yeah. I heard a talk once at the Division of Dynamical Astronomy many years ago um, from one of the orbital mechanicians who was involved at the beginning. And he was talking about how the Air Force came to him and said, look, we're going to get this mishmash of observations. And we yeah. need you to change yeah. your astronomical equations to solve for an Earth orbit quickly <laughs> based on time and elevation. And at some point, they started getting radar observations, too. I'm not sure how soon that was. Well, Minitrack. Oh, Minitrack was a radar source? Was, yeah. No, no, it was a t uh, telemetry uh, beeping. That wasn't well, radar. Well, some, they were going to get Doppler. They were getting Doppler. Yeah, they were getting Doppler. And That's right. The change was also, they didn't have much, of any computers at the time. They needed 57. Well, 57 ones, maybe. 50 women in a room <laughs> arranged. <laughs> yeah. Oh, sure. You had to come up with computational forms. Yeah. Which, which you could input. Yeah. What, one of the problems was they're going to get a lot of observations all of a sudden. That's so right. Everybody was doing it. And the computation center at uh, at Harvard-Smithsonian was uh, a marvel of efficiency for that, too. 
uh, the people who ran it, uh, I think, are incredible unsung heroes. And they, they remained that way because then when they went with the Baker Nun stuff, uh, they, uh, there was an initial processing that was done at the stations, but only very, very rough. And then the, everything was sent in. And then they did not have much time to make the, uh, make the precise orbit analysis in order for them to come up with stuff that was of use to NASA or other people. And the Air Force was very interested in uh, the procedures that Smithsonian had. I mean, there was very close uh, cooperation there for a number of years until the Air Force decided they wanted to classify it. And that's when Whipple and others went to war, literally, uh, at, um, uh, with uh, Don Hornig and others. The President's Science Advisor uh, said, no, no, it has to be unclassified. And things like the Smithsonian Standard Earth, all of the geodetic stuff that came out of that, that was the stuff that they wanted classified. Yeah. Fun. Question. Yeah. Did you ever consider writing a book based on all this stuff and projecting how it affects, you know, the process today of like, oh. Goddard being plugged in? I, I, I am not, uh, there's, a brand, there's a brand of, of historian uh, who engages in science and technology studies, who does those sorts of policy kinds of histories. Uh, I produce the history, and I am writing a history of the Smithsonian astrophysical during this whole time that says some of this, yes. Uh, but it is not, uh, it, it's not uh, packaged in, in that sort of way. If people want to use it, that's great. Uh, and, and I have no problem with that. But it's, um, uh, when, when you start doing the science and technology studies, then you start getting interested in those specific questions. I frankly am more interested in how it changed the discipline of astronomy, which is of no interest to right. policy people, <laughs> unfortunately. Well, I look forward to your book. Yeah, yeah, well, people are, are it's only five years late. Uh, it's a NASA grant. I should thank NASA. Uh, and um, they gave me um, a nice uh, support to do oral histories and travel and uh, collect documentation and that sort of thing. And uh, I'm on what is supposedly the last chapter, which is how the Smithsonian and Harvard sort of had a meltdown in 71, 72, and became the Center for Astrophysics and then had nothing but overhead problems after that, how they reconciled overhead problems. But it, by then it was a, a commonly understood problem of how you get a research institute, federally funded research institute, connected to a university department because the research institute is very project oriented, very goal oriented, whereas the university by character is not. And how do you get those two to work together seamlessly? And uh, there are a number of good examples uh, in astronomy. Uh, the Joint Institute for Laboratory Astrophysics does quite well, as, as does the CFA now. Uh, but there was a real problem back in the late 60s. And that was partly because of the big budget cutbacks. Does, does the CFA get both appropriated funds and endowment funds on the Smithsonian side? On the Smithsonian side, there are endowment funds. Uh, there are, uh, it's called the trust side. And uh, part of those endowment funds are generated uh, by the revenue of the Smithsonian itself, mm -hmm. but others are straight endowments. That's right. So uh, there are at least three different kinds of money. There's Harvard uh, money, that's uh, right. appropriated funds, Smithsonian endowment, Harvard endowment. That's right. That's the power. Yes. That was what that diagram, that kind of diagram shows, that, you know, how, how, how you can survive good times and bad and smooth them out. Pardon? Like Ricardo Giacomi might have left Harvard to, uh, to go to Hubble? Well, that's, that's after the end of my book. Okay. <laughs> that's, that, that's the, uh, what is that? The, uh, uh, that's, that's make friends with Barbara Mikulski and go to Baltimore. Well, yeah. Oh, she is amazing. Yeah. Uh, I mean, she, uh, talk about uh, New Horizons. Whoa. She, she just stood up to everybody. And, you know, what finally is going to hit Pluto or not hit Pluto or something. Oh, she, she's just an amazing person. I mean, for her focus on Goddard and 
on on space. Yeah. We Marylanders will continue to vote for her. You what? Sorry. We Marylanders will continue to vote for. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. No, she was at the opening for the Space Telescope Science Institute, and you know I heard this voice down below saying, "Where's that voice coming from?" You. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, anybody else? Any thoughts? Or? Okay, my, my voice is a bit gone, sorry. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.